baseball. It's the all American pastime. A sport so associated with the US and American culture, but it's unthinkable that their national sport, the summer sport, the all American game, could be anything but baseball. However, baseball wasn't always the bat and ball game that the young Yanks loved. In fact, in the early days, cricket, a sport so associated with Britain, was quite popular. George Washington, the first president himself, was quite a fan of the sport. And even well into the 19th century, cricket remained quite popular. But in the land of so many sporting leagues, such as the NBL, Major Baseball League, as the most apt comparison, the NBL, NBA, and NFL, cricket in America is small. Very, very small. But it wasn't always that way. So how did cricket go from becoming being a promising pastime that beckoned with potential to what it is today? In this video, we will be examining its decline. Cricket is a sport more associated with the British, Australians, and Indians. Hell, if you were to look at the American cricket team today, you would see that it is uh, dominated by the recent waves of migrants from the Indian subcontinent and the West Indies. In America, cricket's roots began as far back as 1709, with the earliest records of the sport in the colonies coming from a Virginian plantation owner, William Byrd of Westover, and, and this was found in his diaries of 1709. By the 1750s, the sport was growing, healthily in fact. In 1751, the first New York Gazette and Weekly Post Boys recorded the game between a London 11, 11 meaning a team of side, and 11 from New York City. New York won the match. In 1754, Benjamin Franklin returned from England, and he brought with him a copy of the 1744 Laws, Cricket's official rulebook. And come the Revolutionary War, while George Washington himself was playing in games of cricket, with Valley Forge anecdotal evidence suggesting games of cricket were happening, with some stating that Washington himself even participated in one game. When America gained its independence, John Adams would dismiss the title of president. When it came to deciding what to call the leader of a country, Adams criticized the term. They are presidents of fire companies and cricket clubs. Throughout record, Adams believed his mightiness, his highness, or his elective majesty were the titles to go. I think Mr. President was the right call. One could assume that with America's newfound independence, Having broken from the change of the British Empire, but perhaps a culture of anti-Britishness would wrap the nation following the revolution, and that this would actually be the cause of cricket's demise. It'd be a fair assessment, but an incorrect one. Cricket remained popular post-war, and actually only grew. Cricket equipment was being advertised in the New York Independent Journal, while newspapers frequently reported young gentlemen and men of fashion playing the sport. Artwork of du at Dartmouth College from the time shows young people enjoying the sport. Cricket would reach its popularity in the US by around the mid 1800s. In fact, the sport was more popular than baseball even into the 1850s. It was played across 22 states and over 125 cities, and there were often annual cricket conventions. It was most popular among the American Northeast Coast, particularly in Pennsylvania. In 1833, at Harvest Short College, the first cricket club exclusively for Americans was founded. The club didn't last long, but it would help grow the sport. New York St. George's Cricket Club was founded in 1839, and the Philadelphia Union Cricket Club in 1843. A significant milestone in the history of cricket altogether occurred in 1844. International cricket tests are a mainstay of the sport today great rivalries such as the English and the Australians. A cricket's first rivalry and the world's first official international cricket match took place between two countries, not the most associated with the sport today, that being America and Canada at Bloomingdale Park in Manhattan. 10,000 people attended the match. There was significant support for it and bets were placed. In 1849, Abraham Lincoln himself would actually attend a match between Chicago and Milwaukee. However, cricket was beginning to be challenged in America around this same time, around its pinnacle. Baseball was on the rise, and had been 
for a while. But the sports were still on a level playing field. Cricket was still the more popular sport, and we can tell that from news reports way even up until 1855, that some papers like the New York Press were still devoting more time to the coverage of cricket than baseball. Between 1859 to 1872, Sides from England were two of the US and Canada. The English cricket seasons of 1859, 68 and 72. In tours all organised their commercial ventures. The 1859 team compromised six players from the All England 11 and six from the United All England 11 and was captained by George Parr. They played five matches, winning them all. There was no first class fixtures. The match in New York attracted a crowd that was claimed to be at 10,000, a packed stadium. But the fortunes of cricket were about to hit a huge wicket, or a strike, out in America, as baseball, baseball was on the rise and striking home runs. Baseball's rise and cricket's demise are linked. Baseball's origins are actually difficult to precisely pinpoint, many believing that the sport roots back to as far back as the 1300s and might have some origins in France, with some manuscripts from France appearing to depict clerics playing a game that seemed very similar to baseball. While other sources state that baseball and cricket share a common ancestor from the game of rounders. Baseball was actually a British game in many ways, and we can see the first mentions of baseball more specifically as far back as 1744 in Britain. The sport of baseball was actually introduced to America much later than cricket. Its first mention in America occurred in 1791. So crack had had the head start, but baseball had gradually grown, and by the 1830s, baseball was growing with several uncodified games across North America. However, in 1845, only a year after the first international cricket game, a watershed moment would occur with baseball, with Alexander Cartwright, who many dubbed the father of modern baseball, producing a code of baseball rules known as the Knickerbocker Rules. Although some cast doubts on whether these sets of rules actually were original, nonetheless, it would be instrumental in baseball's rise. Baseball went through rapid growth in the 1850s, especially in New York City. And in 1856, we get the first references of baseball as being the national pastime, being made by New York journalists. Even four years prior to the Civil War, the first 16 New York clubs formed a national association and established a championship, and in 1859, local baseball clubs would surpass the U.S. cricket clubs for the first time. And, well, cricket never would catch up again. Strike two for, for cricket in America would be the Civil War, which was especially destructive to cricket. One could say that the bat and ball Civil War was decided by the actual Civil War, and it was during this time that baseball secured its place as America's game, while cricket really began its terminal decline. Baseball was easier to play than cricket. Cricket had more complex rules, and the need to play on a flat surface to pitch the ball severely limited game matches. With a game of cricket often lasting a long time, five or more days, while comparatively baseball could be played anywhere, a game that was far easier to organise on any patch of ground. Union generals could make a brief stop and play a game of baseball, anywhere. The format of the game of cricket then would last five or more days. Baseball in America, or modern times, has been seen a bit of a decline, as many see the sport as actually being slowed compared to the faster-paced NFL and NBL. But in the 1860s, compared to cricket, baseball was the fast-paced game. And through the war, Union soldiers helped spread baseball, with captured soldiers often playing in often playing in prison camps. Confederates would, Confederate guards would then watch. And by the end of the war, the sport was being played on both sides. In Ohio, there was one game between the Southern and Confederate Knights that reportedly grew, drew a crowd of 3,000 people, including guards and inmates. While the war tore the nation apart, baseball would help bring it back together. Cricket never recovered from the Civil War. In fact, cricket's fans had given up on a broad national-type sporting competition with broad appeal after the Civil War, while baseball would go on to thrive. Cricket retreated into amateurism. 
And it didn't help cricket itself, but it would be its own worst enemy in America. Cricket in the US would hold on to its more elitist amateur status and never evolved into becoming a game of the people like, a, like it did across much of the British Empire. They also encouraged crossover between cricket and the developing game of baseball. And as a result, baseball had grown so much during the Civil War, the baseball teams such as the Cincinnati Red Stockings would begin poaching some of the best cricket players. Harry Wright, one of the most influential people in the history of baseball, actually began as a cricketer, playing for the St. George's Cricket Club in New York. He was a bowler. And after the Civil War, though, he was recruited by the Cincinnati Red Stockings, and he would actually be instrumental in many of the innovations of the fledgling game of baseball. Many of these developments had their roots in cricket. He would apply scientific batting and specialized placements of fielders that he had learned in cricket to baseball. And with these tactics would help Cincinnati have one of the greatest seasons in baseball history. They went undefeated in 1869. So Wright contributed massively to baseball's growth. But he began as a cricketer. Many other cricket players also began to move over to baseball as cricket declined. Nick Young, who actually would go on to serve as president of for over 25 years of the National League, was also a cricketer at first. And one of the reasons he joined baseball was it looked like cricket for which his soul thirsted. Cricket wasn't helped by four performances in international matches against the English, and many felt the Americans would never be successful at an Englishman's game. So many cricket clubs converted to being baseball clubs. There was one holdout for cricket role in America. That was in Pennsylvania. The Marion Cricket Club, founded in 1865, was very passionate about the sport and thwarted attempts to convert the club into a baseball club. Their club members passed a resolution that the remaining baseball equipment at the club needed to be sold off as quickly as possible to guarantee the purpose of a club was for cricket. In Philadelphia, the Philadelphian cricket team would prove quite a success. They represented Philly in first-class cricket matches between 1878 and 1913. And there were players from four chief clubs in Philadelphia, from Germantown, Marion, Belmont, and Philadelphia. Players from smaller clubs such as Tioga and Moorestown, and local colleges such as Harvard. Harvesford also played for the Philadelphians. The Philadelphian Cricket Club would actually play test matches, and they played in 88 first-class cricket matches. And they beat all the foreign nations at least once. So they weren't probably the best, they went on to upset some good teams, and this included the Australians in 1893 and 96, stunning the cricket world. The Philadelphians would produce great cricketers such as George Patterson, John Lester, and most highly regarded of them all, Bart King. King was a, uh, well, the king of American cricket. He was a skilled batsman and bowler. Who was mostly forgotten to history. Had he been an Australian or an Englishman, he would have been a cricket immortal. In fact, when he passed in 1965, long after cricket had been forgotten in America, England hadn't forgotten him. In the Times newspaper, they quoted Plum Warner saying that had he been an Englishman or an Australian, he would have been even more famous than he was. While great Australian cricketers such as George Giffen and Donald Bradman rated him highly. Sir Pelman Warner described Bart King as one of the finest bowlers of all time, while Donald Bradman called him America's greatest cricketing son. For Americans, Bradman is in Australia is kind of seen as the babe roof of cricket. So that is quite some high regard. King had the highest first-class bowling average in 1908 and was known for his trademark swing bowling style, which he called the Angler. In a game against Australia in 1893, King took five wickets for 78 runs. He was a dominant bowler on his team when it toured in England in 1897, 1903, and 1908. He dismissed batsmen with his Angler delivery. In his 65 games, he took 415 wickets. An impressive record. Shea Warne, who's regarded by many as one of the greatest bowlers of all time, got 708 wickets in 145 games. He was a fine batsman as well. And he held the record for most runs by an American, which was set in 1906, with 344 against Belmont versus Marion B. He scored 39 centuries in his career, 
and he topped the 1,000 runs in a season six times, in four of them, also taking over 100 wickets. Philadelphia was successful due to its broad support from the city, with cricket remaining popular in Philadelphia until even the first two decades of the 20th century. Cricket's last bastion in the US would not last. With a poor performance in England in 1908, strike three was on its way. Philadelphian cricket was actually in rapid decline. The tides of fortune were the sport all but secured when in 1909 the ICC was formed, now known as the International Cricket Committee. The ICC had an exclusionary nature to countries outside the British Empire. Thus, America was not welcome. The sport was already suffering. Not even the great bar king could keep it going. The rejection by the ICC was essentially the final blow for cricket in America, and probably one of the dumbest decisions by the ICC. And they've made a lot of dumb decisions, as instead of trying to grow the sport, they snuffed it out. American cricket had little influence on the global game, and any momentum to professionalize in cricket in the US was lost. Cricket in 1909 had long been surpassed but by baseball, but sport still had a followers, especially in Pennsylvania. Alas, it was not meant to be. Cricket's decline, even in Philadelphia, was already in place. Grassroot cricket was waning. Sports like golf and tennis began to take the place of the elites during for their leisure time. And from 1905, matches began to gr- drop. Great clubs shut down, including Bar King's club, the Belmont Cricket Club, which dismantled in 1914. The last first-class match was played in 1913. And in 1929, the final issue of the American Cricketer was released. By the 1920s, cricket had fallen and baseball was king. Players like Babe Ruth would only further cement baseball into a mythological status within the States. Had America been actually welcomed by the ICC, then cricket may not be the first, second, or even third most popular sport in America today. Unlikely, in fact. It could have certainly maintained and grown into a niche sport niche, a popular sport in the US. Similar to, say, what the National Hockey League is today. Matches against Americans would certainly have made for some great cricket rivalries between, say, the Australians, Indians, and English. In 1965, America was finally welcomed by the ACC, but by then it was far too late. Cricket could have been so much more. Thank you guys, and if you enjoyed this, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe for more.